United States Air Force, along with the United States as a whole, finds itself at a crossroads. For the better part of a century, the Air Force has essentially designed and built itself around one singular mission, which is to counter the advances of the Soviet Union. Since the fall of the USSR, the US Air Force has found itself directionless. With the Soviet bloc no longer existing, much of their Air Force has since become defunct, as the cost of maintaining so much equipment simply outpaces the economy that's never truly recovered in the past 30 years. As such, advanced programs in the United States were abruptly cancelled, and a focus on counterinsurgency took the center stage, only for a new rival to be found in China which resulted in the United States scrambling to have the means to take on a near-peer threat. This is a story everyone with even a surface-level understanding of military analyzation understands. However, the problems are much more severe to the point where it threatens the nation's national security as a whole. The Missing Generation the process of designing and building the F-22 took from the late 80s to the early 2000s, resulted in the most advanced combat aircraft in the history of mankind, only to be shut down prematurely. The F-35 was intended to replace the fourth generation of aircraft and drive down the cost of stealth. Meanwhile, it has essentially missed the fifth generation, and instead will supplement the sixth generation of air superiority fighter aircraft. The result is the Air Force doesn't have enough air superiority fighters that can survive a near-peer threat, which places the burden on the F-35. While the F-35 is certainly capable of taking on this task, it certainly isn't ideal as they also have to take on the destruction of high-value ground targets and enemy anti-air defenses, which is their primary mission. Mystical Range Requirements U.S. officials claim that none of the aircraft in the current fleet have sufficient range to deal with an Asian threat. This claim in itself seems rather dubious as surface-to-surface -surface missiles have had a global reach long before the end of the Cold War. Air Force doctrine from the era even acknowledges this fact by wanting to disperse aircraft along as many makeshift air bases as possible. To expand upon this further, a method of forward deploying aircraft with C-130s has been developed and tested with F-22s, F-35s, and F-16s. However, from the sounds of things, it seems the Air Force wants to simply outrange every threat, which isn't very practical as medium-range missiles can engage as far out as Guam. In order to outrange this threat entirely, aircraft would have to be launched from Wake Island, which means it would take the better part of a day just to get to the battlefield, let alone carry out a mission in return. These kinds of ranges engulf the entirety of Japan and South Korea, the countries the US would use as a staging area in the event it were to go to war with China. South Korea's capital, Seoul, is only about 250 miles from the Chinese mainland. If the Air Force is correct and aircraft really do need to have the range to defend themselves from surface-to-surface -surface missiles, then that logic means they simply cannot defend South Korea and Japan, and as such should not field any aircraft in those countries as they would simply be cannon fodder. Continuing this logic further, this also implies that carriers are in fact completely useless as both the F-35 and F-18 Super Hornet have a range of about a thousand miles one way. This would put an aircraft carrier at about the same distance as Japan, if each aircraft could be refueled once on both legs in midair. Needless to say, despite the advances in missile technology, this does seem rather ridiculous. Air bases have been in a range of these threats long before the Cold War has ended. While missiles have become more capable, so too has electronic countermeasures, missile interceptors, and lasers. While the supercarrier has the issue of presenting too much risk for the reward, dispersing aircraft among many highways and airbases remedies this problem rather sufficiently, especially if locations in use could be kept in random rotations. Saving cost by kicking the can. Despite everything mentioned before, the Air Force maintains it needs more range, and so technology designed for the F-22 and F-35 that has been cut for reducing costs are now being integrated into a brand new fighter design, implying the previous two aircraft should have had this technology to begin with. The technology implied here is the variable bypass ratio engine. Ultimately, increasing fuel efficiency just wasn't viable after the F-110, so a loss of efficiency was deemed acceptable to increase power and supersonic performance. However, the supersonic regime favors small bypass ratios, even turbojets, as opposed to turbofans, as the turbofan presents too much drag. However, at subsonic regimes, the opposite is true. The larger the turbofan, generally speaking, the better the fuel efficiency. Variable bypass ratio engines would essentially fix this problem, allowing for a larger bypass ratio at slower speeds, increasing efficiency, and retain the capability to revert to a turbojet at supersonic speeds. 
Both the F-22 and F-35 have room in the airframes for these engines, as it was initially intended to be integrated onto the F-22 from the very beginning. In hindsight, it would have made the most sense to simply relegate the F-22 and F-35 to a technology demonstrator role until a new peer threat emerged, so they could then be produced at large scale before the conflict truly became hot. In the meantime, fourth generation aircraft continued to be a competent deterrent. As technology matures, diminishing returns kicks into effect. With the exception of stealth, there is no design revolution to be had with fighter aircraft. For this reason, fourth generation aircraft continue to be just as a lethal deterrent as they were when first entering service 50 years ago, as the airframe isn't outdated, but instead the avionics, which are far easier to replace. Instead, fifth generation aircraft were pressed into service, missing key features that are required for current conflicts. Despite the planes being designed for future threats in mind in the first place, requiring the development of new aircraft to implement the features that were already delayed. Lost in the Dark Fewer airframes capable of multiple roles, or many aircraft types to specialize in many mission types. This is the, one of the most fundamental questions to be asked long before the establishment of an Air Force and needs to be re-evaluated every decade. With different officials taking different stances, it shouldn't come as a surprise. However, it's extremely concerning when there isn't a clear plan of action or overarching philosophy towards force composition when we're at the stage of large portions of aircraft aging out of the force with no plans of replacement. Currently there are about 20 B-2s, 6 B-1s, 180 F-22s, with 20 slated to retire, and 200 F-15Cs. All of these aircraft are so few in number that the cost per aircraft increases over time as manufacturing parts aren't worth it economically. It's much more profitable to use that manufacturing and logistical capability on other products. Therefore, the cost increases to reimburse the manufacturer on that missed economic opportunity. The reverse is also true, meaning were the Air Force to procure an airframe in greater numbers, the price per unit decreases as more are made, so it can be beneficial to have only a small set of aircraft types to fulfill the missions as they then share logistical pipelines, and per aircraft costs are driven down. That's not to say having multiple airframes is a bad idea either, as each airframe can be specialized for missions that are otherwise extremely taxing. This was the case during the Gulf War, as you had F-15s for air superiority, F-16s for suppression of enemy air defenses, F-4s for reconnaissance, F-111s for interdiction and electronic warfare, A-10s for frontline support, and so on. The result is the third largest air force on the globe was defeated in a month. The stark difference, however, is each aircraft had hundreds of models in service at the time, meaning you have parts being made, and it's not catastrophic to cannibalize parts in the meantime. A proposal going forward. Moving forward, a mixture of these two philosophies is probably required. Traditionally, the Air Force likes to have a high-low mix, with the high being an expensive but extremely capable aircraft, while the low is an aircraft that is still mostly capable, typically has multiple capabilities, and can be operated cheaply. Currently, that would look like the F-22 and F-35. However, the last few conflicts doesn't require such capabilities, meaning the operating and procurement costs wouldn't be worth it for low-end scenarios. For that reason, it would make more sense to have an additional aircraft to pick up the slack once the high-end threats are gone, such as the F-16 or the rumored F-36. Finally, having an extremely low-cost aircraft for training and home airspace policing would lower operating costs vastly instead of using cutting-edge fighters to intercept Cessna 172s. Perhaps being able to equip T-7 Red Hawks with old AIM-9s would fulfill this role adequately. The next generation air dominance program is set to replace the F-22 with a new aircraft, and a drone wingman to complement it in the F-35. This is a step in the right direction, as drones traditionally have extremely low operating cost, compared to even the cheapest fighter aircraft. That said, this is all theoretical from the perspective of a hobbyist analyzer, but this mix would allow a healthy amount of capable yet low cost aircraft, offering more for the dollar while maintaining a cutting edge. If the entire blade is the edge, then they'll have no backbone to give strength, while a blade that is all backbone and no edge will be strong but unable to cut. Thank you for watching, and we hope you found this video informative. For more videos on aviation news and topics, please subscribe. In the meantime, enjoy your dance with the angels.